Well, there's a whole set of things going on in this passage, okay? And um, if you've never read John's Gospel before, I'll try and kind of summarize where we're up to up at this point. Uh, John is one of 12 disciples of Jesus. Uh, He was extremely close to Jesus. uh, And uh, long after Jesus was uh, was gone back, returned to heaven, uh, John kind of writes uh, his, his account of everything that's happened. And he writes his gospel around one central idea, I think, really. And if you had to choose one word, it would be life, okay? I think think John is concerned around the notion of what is life in all its rich, uh, multicolored, spiritual richness. And John is explaining through the gospel the kind of life that Jesus lived and the kind of life that Jesus offers. And in this passage, it's, it's really important for us to to kind of um, consider in the light of that question, like how do we change the world? So we think about the massive problems that we've got going on, it doesn't matter whether it's climate change or a bankrupt council and everything in between, you know, conflict in Gaza, everything else. Maybe we assume there's fairly simple solutions that we or our politicians could do to change the world. And we have a a bent towards kind of uh, simplicity. But it's obvious to anyone who knows the slightest amount of history, um, that these issues are hard and complex and everything else, I'm really struck to look at this, that Jesus has profoundly and permanently changed the world. And I think this passage explains what is going on as to why Jesus changed the world in the way he has, and that that then changes our relationship with how we think about changing the world. And so this passage, it has a number of kind of threads going through. I'll Rather than kind of going through it verse by verse, just try and join all the threads together so we can try and make sense of it. But I think the major threads are around power, glory, suffering, and, and, and how we change the world. And the passage, I know it's long, and I know there's these overlapping themes, but we've got this one central idea that Jesus introduces that changes everything. But before we get to it, let me say this, okay? There are some key events happening that are sort of building through John 11 and 12. And so let me just set these out as well so that you've got a, a kind of complete background of, of what's informing this. Last week, if you were here, um, kind of looking at Jesus' greatest kind of final miracle, not including his own resurrection, okay? Um, but the disciples and Jesus were heading back to Jerusalem knowing that they were going to uh, run into persecution and problems and issues, um, and uh, Jesus uh, kind of stops by, sees, he knows that his friend Lazarus has died, and he raises Lazarus from the dead after he's been dead for four days. And it's a remarkable miracle. At the same time, Jesus, as he's talking through it, Martha says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that miracle and the saying around it as well has kind of, as though Jesus wasn't kind of well known enough, it's kind of propelled Jesus to new levels of popularity and influence. Um, it's kind of a stratospheric, A-grade celebrity at that point. Um, and not just with sort of fame, but fame with expectation. Fame that with Jesus coming to the city, something huge is going to happen. Maybe there's going to be a revolution, or there's going to be a coup, or there's going to be something is about to happen. It's like... Um, And I think if you were caught up in it, it would have that feeling of Obama's presidency, you know, like, or the the start of it, the inauguration before all of that. Like, what's going to happen? Like, the savior is coming. Like, I I think there there was some sense of that, even within Obama's um, presidency in the early days. You know, the savior has come, okay? It's, It's got that sort of momentum building. And so at the end of chapter 12, people have started announce. sorry, beginning of, yeah, beginning of chapter 12, people are beginning to announce Jesus as their new king. And they are literally um, putting palm blanches in front of him and singing, blessed is the new king of Israel. Okay, so it's like you get a sense of what's going on here. And the Pharisees, who are the religious gatekeepers, are desperately unhappy as they, and they basically see what's going on, and they see this conclusion and say to each other, this is the very first, the verse before the passage we looked at just over the page, says, they say, the whole world has gone after him. It's like, oh no, he is occupying a status of influence and power that is hugely threatening. And... Um, 
they actually, from that point, this is where the plot to, to kill Jesus really again sort of ramps up as they, as they realize the depth of his popularity and think we've got to, um, we've got to get rid of him. <clears throat> then, at the start of this passage in verse 21... I don't know whether you noticed this, just a kind of easy thing to miss on, on the way through. Um, but right at the start of the passage uh, that Sarah read, verse 21, some Greeks turn up wanting to meet Jesus. And the details of that, the details of the whole passage are quite significant. We don't have time to go into them. But they're Greeks, God-fearing, come to celebrate the Passover festival, which again is in turn really significant. This is the point where Jesus is about to die. It's also over the Passover. It was the key moment of their religious year, celebrating when God's judgment from death passed over his people and set them free from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus replies to their request for, to, to have an audience with him. He says in verse 23, very sort of enigmatically, the hour has come for the Son of Man, that's how Jesus refers to himself, to be glorified. So this, and if that doesn't make sense to you in terms of the hour that has come, all the way through John's gospel, Jesus has been saying, the hour has not yet come, the hour is not here. And it's, he's talking about an hour of glory or glorification, a moment when his true identity, the true reality of God's presence with his people will finally be seen and revealed. It's not just attached to fame, but beyond power and all of that sort of stuff. And that finally, that's going to be seen. Okay, and this, so this hour, this is the first time Jesus says, the hour has come, you're going to see, you're going to see. And of course, the crowd listening in, they would sort of, if they were party to it, would think, brilliant, because in their mind, this kind of glory that's going to be revealed is attached to political and maybe military might. This is how you change the world. You know, back to our earlier question. Show your power. Give us the glory. Here we go. And it's a notion that I think our culture right now deeply connects with. To change the world, it's not about ideas. Ideas don't change the world. That's so like, you know, that, that's TED Talks from, you know, 20 years ago. Ideas don't change the world. It's not even influence, you know, you don't even want influence. It's not like being an influencer, you get to change. That's so five years ago. Now it's all about political change making. To be an agent for change, you need force. You need to actually be able to compel people to change things. And so for them hearing what Jesus now saying, the hour of glory is here and the whole world is coming to him and the momentum behind Jesus is huge. It, this is what it would feel like to be caught up in a revolution or a coup when you've got a very large crowd of people who are trying to make you king and it's looking good and Jesus is in on it or so you think because he's saying the hour of glory is here and we're thinking, yeah, here we go. This sounds really good. And yet, then what Jesus says through the rest of chapter 12, and this is not a three-point sermon, by the way. It's a one-point sermon. And the point is this, okay, Jesus' main idea, and I think this idea is one of the most unexpected, unwelcome, and subversive revolutionary ideas, not just within Christianity, but the, the effect that Christianity has had on the world. And I think it's this. You can put this up. Like, have I built it up enough? Okay? But I think it's this. Glory and life comes through sacrifice and death. Glory and life actually come through sacrifice and death. And then Jesus talks through two things. What Jesus does, and then we'll see in a second what what he's calling us to. Have a look at verse 24. I think it's verses like this that have changed the course of human history. Very truly, I tell you, okay, this is, so this is, that's Jesus adding emphasis here, the equivalent of saying, listen up, everyone. What I'm about to say is going to, you know, rock things. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies... It produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must also follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, I know that's quite long, and you might be thinking, oh, I'm struggling to unpack that. I'm not sure that sounds that revolutionary to me. 
This is the whole heartbeat of this passage, and it is foundational to understanding Jesus and how Jesus changed the world, and it is foundational to what Jesus calls us to. Now, what Jesus does or what this really means. Now, what Jesus is doing is preparing his disciples for what happens next to say, the hour of glorification that's coming is not actually a revolution or a coup or taking Jerusalem by force. But you will know when I'm being glorified because you will see me being lifted up to die. Verse 27, it's really Really clear, this, is the, the, this hour is about his death. My soul is troubled. Do I pray, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Or verse 32, and when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And it's clear what happens over the next week. This is the week when Jesus dies that the disciples have no real sense of what Jesus is talking about. Or if they do, they can't accept it. Because when Jesus is killed, how do all the disciples respond? They scatter. They look at Jesus' death and think, it's failure. It's disaster. The whole mission of Jesus has been a failure. It ends with death. But what Jesus is saying in verse 24 with his illustration of the kernel of wheat is saying, no, the mission begins with death and then through death. So real life will come. World-changing, world-rocking life. The mission begins with death. It doesn't end with death. And the very moments of humiliation, the moment of total and complete weakness, the moment of sacrifice, of death, is the very thing that looks like failure. That is the moment of glory. And it's this very thing that makes Jesus successful, attractive, effective, all those, those sorts of things that we might not associate with death. Because we know that what Jesus is doing through his death on the cross is more than just bringing around political change, bearing the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders, acting as a sacrifice in our place. And of course, we, well, of course the resurrection of Jesus changes how we view his death, so we know it's not the end. But in this passage, what Jesus is doing is saying the moment of death is connected with glory. With glory. And that's, that's mind-blowing. It's difficult to see human speak, humanly speaking. How can death, even a very public death, in fact, it was the most humiliating form of death. Crucifixion was banned from citizens of Rome to be uh, caught up in because it was so humiliating. Naked, on a cross, wearing a crown of thorns, ironic sign behind Jesus saying, here's your king of the Jews. The most ridiculing, humiliating kind of death. How can anyone see that as a moment of glory. And yet Jesus is saying, when you see that, you're seeing my glory. And verse 28 is praying, Father, glorify your name. And the, the, I think this is so hard to believe, the connection between death and glory, especially a kind of a really humiliating, ignominious death, is that it requires an audible voice booming from heaven, from God saying, I have glorified and I will glorify it again. As if they need proof that Jesus has not totally lost it. They need a direct voice from God saying, yes, his death is what glory looks like. And again, for us who've, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, doesn't really matter. You've grown up in a culture where this connection between death and glory has always been foundational for us. But in a Roman culture, the culture Jesus is in, it's hard to understand how humiliating and ridiculous this would sound. In his book, um, Dominion, the secular historian Tom Holland reminds us how revolutionary this act really is. He says in the ancient world, it's kind of, um, you know, showing pity or grace or even kindness to someone, let alone self-sacrifice, was regarded as a character flaw, not a character strength. In fact, I've got a little quote from, from him if you want to put it up. The heroes of the Iliad, favorites of the gods, golden and predatory, had scorned the weak and the downtrodden. The starving deserved no sympathy. 
Beggars were best rounded up and deported. Pity risked undermining a wise man's self-control. And what Tom Holland's saying is, they thought showing kindness to people was a character flaw. And in the single moment of history where God makes his character most visible, where he reveals himself in all his glory, all his fullness, most completely, what God shows you about himself is that, well, he's not disinterested in the weak. He doesn't overlook the poor. He doesn't forget the marginalized. In fact, he not only condescends himself down to our level, but he goes deeper still, willingly, gladly, to die in our place. And it's a remarkable thing that Jesus, so many times in John's gospel, he says, no one takes my life from me. I willingly give my life. He gives it up for the sake of others. And the very fact that we think that the weak, the vulnerable, ought to be cared for, the fact that we want a universal healthcare system that is free at the point of entry, the fact that we want a universal state pension so that elderly people don't have to worry about poverty, whatever it is, these sort of things that we have as collective shared values, those very things that our culture regards as precious and virtuous, they are not accidental, and they are not a sign of some great moral human evolution that we've advanced to this stage. They stem from this single moment of human history when God revealed himself and said, this is who I am and this is what I'm really like. This is what true glory looks like. This is the beauty of the cross. And maybe you've forgotten this and you started to think, no, true glory for me is saving myself or fighting all my own battles, securing my own victory. We've got to come back and remember the center of our faith. We are dependent beings. We are dependent on a God who sacrificed himself for us on our behalf, who entered all of our vulnerability and failure and bore it upon himself. And we've got to, again, celebrate that once more. But here in this passage, there is something even more stark and troubling. And it's the second part of this. It's, it's what does Jesus expect from us? What does Jesus expect from us? What does he call us to? See, I suspect that we're all really happy with the idea. We're on board now with Jesus acting like this. With Jesus saying, this is how Jesus works, how Jesus acts. But now Jesus does something much bigger and says, no, look, this goes beyond just that single act. This is now the currency of his new kingdom. This isn't just a one-time deal. This is what Jesus invites us into to follow in terms of our relationship with glory, suffering, and power. And Jesus actually expects his people to follow this pattern. Think, actually, I'm being polite. Jesus demands that we follow this pattern to a life of self-sacrifice. Look at verse 20, 25 and 26 again. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will also be. And we're like, what? Well, Jesus, when you go to the cross, we expect to be there with you, Jesus? Yes, yeah, so I think that's what he's inviting us into. And I think this is really difficult for us because our, our culture is kind of torn in two opposite directions. We believe in some sense of collectivism and, and valuing the other and being part of something bigger than ourselves. But we're also profoundly individualistic and want everything on our terms and want to never have to choose suffering or pain or giving up anything. I mean, like, you know, as you think about issues of how we solve the climate crisis, those are the sorts of things that are being wrestled through. And those two things only ever really resolved if we believe in some sense, some notion of self-sacrifice. And I think actually Jesus in this passage gives us kind of three options, three choices, three directions. See, there's one group of people, they look at Jesus and they don't believe Jesus and therefore they don't follow Jesus. That's the first group on the top there. <clears throat> in verse 37, <clears throat> 
excuse me, there are people who've seen the signs. They've seen Lazarus being resurrected from the dead. They've seen Jesus and they're kind of wowed by Jesus, but still they don't believe. And in verses 39, verse 40, Jesus explains why they don't believe. It's actually God's judgment. It's the same spirit of what had happened hundreds of years earlier in the time of Isaiah, when Isaiah had been called to preach to people who hadn't believed, and actually the process of his preaching hadn't opened people's minds, it had closed people's minds. And it was prompted by, well, some sense of the same thing going on. We like to think we're open-minded, don't we? But when someone comes along and speaks absolute unavoidable truth, if we don't like it because it just exposes all of our prejudice and how we really are at the core of our being, it turns out we don't want to hear it. People like the Pharisees saying their whole lives, we want the Messiah, we're waiting for the Messiah, we want the Messiah, and then the Messiah comes and they say, well, we don't want this kind of Messiah, and they plot to kill the Messiah. Like, how do you make sense of that? Well, that's the nature of unbelief. The truth creates a visceral response, like someone who's got an allergic reaction to truth. They're not apathetic to Jesus, they hate him. And and what's the explanation for that? And and John's really clear, Isaiah is the explanation. That same thing that was going on in Isaiah's day is the same thing that's going on in Jesus' day. In fact, verse 41 says, Isaiah said all of this and functioned like he did because he got some sense of Jesus' glory and spoke about him. And so it's the same visceral reaction that you see going on in the Old Testament as you now do in the, in the New Testament with Jesus. So don't be surprised to see unbelief, even in your own heart, because we're not naturally open-minded to God, not quite as much as we like to think. So there's, a, there's an option there. Don't believe Jesus, don't follow Jesus. There's a second quite troubling option here of people who do believe Jesus but know the cost is significant and choose not to follow. So verse 42 here, there are some of the leaders, leaders of God's people who believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. They're scared. They're scared. They believe Jesus. They're just terrified of what the cost would be if they came out and said it publicly. They know it would mean they'd be put out of the synagogue. And verse 43, I think, exposes the heart, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. That's the heart of the issue. Now, do you see how it connects up with what Jesus said earlier in verse 26? Whoever serves me must follow me. And I think that's the hardest situation to be in, isn't it? They believe Jesus is the real deal, but they realize that to follow Jesus is going to involve, incur some personal cost. For them, it would mean almost certainly being put out of the synagogue. They'd seen the Pharisees do that to people. They knew that was the cost of kind of being publicly vocal about Jesus. And given the choice, sort of, they know that, well, it might believe certain things privately, but they're never going to say it publicly and risk social death. And for some of them, it might mean they lost their jobs or more. Okay, it was costly. And I think for lots of us, we'd want to follow Jesus. We're going to kind of associate this with this idea of, well, I do believe Jesus. I'll give mental assent to this. Like, I, I do believe on some level that Jesus is who he claims to be. It's, that's, that's not the issue I have. It's the following Jesus. I'm happy to believe Jesus. It's just, can I leave? Can I, can I follow but on my own terms, buy into the bits that like help me and benefit me and then opt out of the bits that I find really costly and uncomfortable and painful. And um, like that's the issue we face sometimes, isn't it? Like I'll gladly follow Jesus so long as he helps me to attain the goals that I've set for my life, but I'm not going to give up my goals in order to follow Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that we ought to inflict pain on ourselves deliberately in order to evidence that we're really following Jesus, okay? I'm not saying that. There was a form, by the way, of Christianity in the early centuries where they would go and live out in the desert, and actually some of them would stand on plinths to show how much they were willing to suffer for Jesus. Okay, none of that's just like spiritual self it was physical self-harm. Don't, don't do that. But we have got to be aware that following Jesus costs. And so this is the last category here. Believe Jesus means following Jesus. And that means following him even where it costs us something. And it might be something quite significant. And can I say, as I've been looking at this, I've just, I felt 
profoundly challenged and upset by this again, that following Jesus to the point of self-sacrifice is painful. I've thought about it just in some sense of thinking like even how we think and talk sometimes about church planting or the reasons why we kind of, we want to see things change and, you know, grow and we want to be involved in things that are good. We want to see churches growing and new churches being started and you know, sometimes I spend some time with, I get the privilege of spending my time with people who are younger church leaders who are setting out on a journey, some of them starting churches and doing interesting and exciting things. And I think sometimes about our church planting strategies, you know, how would we plant churches across a whole city or across other cities and different things? And it's exciting to think through that. And we think, oh, how do we help churches to be vocal about Jesus and help churches that are really well adapted into the communities that they're trying to reach? I think there's like, that's a great strategy, isn't it? Think about how we can create culturally adaptive churches and, and different things. That's a great strategy. But as I've been thinking about this again, I've, I've been so troubled by this because what disrupts that strategy is church history. I was listening to an old Tim Keller sermon on this. He's a preacher and, well, he was a preacher and a church planting strategist. And he was reminding me that the, for the early church, in the, in the first centuries, the church, you'd be reading John's gospel here really fresh. That one of the things they'd had to endure through the years about 165 to 180 AD, the cities of the empire were ravaged by the plague. At one point, 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome alone, just in the city of Rome. That's an R number for you, isn't it? We're all, we all know that kind of language now. And wealthy people in the city and in those cities around the Roman Empire did what wealthy families did during the COVID pandemic. What did they all do? They all moved out of the cities. In fact, they even left their families. Saint uh, Dionysius of Alexandria describes the chaos. I've got the quotes for you if you, want to, if you want to read it. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. Now, why am I talking about pandemics again? It's why he goes on to say, what was the response of the church, of Christians? Christians made the decision deliberately to stay, specifically to minister to the dying. And the decision to stay became so costly for the church, at one point it looked like it was going to be an existential threat to the church because Christians started dying out in such huge numbers. He wrote, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, administering to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbor and cheerfully accepting their pains cheerfully. Would you do that? They laid down their lives for the sake of others, motivated by love. And as the whole culture went in one direction, the, it was only the Christians going in the opposite direction, traveling into the cities knocking on doors, as everyone else, as the cities were suddenly empty, all the doors were closed, no one moved around. It was, it was the Christians going door to door, checking in on people, moving food around, nursing those who were close to death. But the fruit of that was one of the most dramatic growth periods of the church in human history. Now, it wasn't necessarily, for the people living in that moment, observable, okay? It wasn't like one day church was empty, the next week they came, the church was full. It happened over the pace of about 50, 60, 70 years, over the space of more than a lifetime. But it was profound because everybody knew the value of Christians were completely different from the values of the world. And it was profoundly, earth-shatteringly different. 
So if you're not a Christian, you're terrified of dying and you're close to dying and someone ministers to you and comes into your home and you know that you could be infecting them with the very thing that will cause them to die and yet they minister to you out of love because they're not scared of death, that does something profound. It can't help but shake to the core what you believe as you encounter something attractive, persuasive. But as you're hearing that as a Christian, doesn't it unsettle you to think, well, what am I willing to give up in order to minister to others? I'll give a bit of money. I'll give a bit of time. I'm not sure I'm willing to trade my life. And yet Dionysius says exactly that. Many in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. And Jesus says in this passage, if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, okay, like that's, for pandemics. <laughs> We're very unlikely, aren't we, to ever live through a pandemic. Let me talk about other areas then. For us, maybe we just need to think through what does it cost us to be a Christian in living in Birmingham in 2024? This week, our council is voting on significant financial cuts in services that will have effects that will be visible for us to see, will shape all sorts of things. It's effects on social services, child safeguarding, adults in care, in terms of homeless provision, difficult things. It's not going to be easy, is it, to stay in a city experiencing upheaval? The question is, what does it look like for us to be willing to stay? if it means dying to self for the sake of others. Even within our own homes, our own families, what does it mean for us to commit to hard situations that come with a grave sense of personal cost, of knowing what things have cost us in order to look after others or care for others? And we know that just from our own personal situations, how much harder even be going beyond our own families to remain in a city experiencing social upheaval. And I suspect for us as a church family, we're going to have to figure out what does it look like to be a church that lives and functions and stays visibly within a, this high street, this corner of the city to say, what does it mean for us to care for our neighbors, to look after people, to offer something different? to love people to the extent that it will cost us significantly. And I don't have any real answers or any real sense of what that might look like. I just, I just know that we will have to be looking at that and praying through it carefully. And secondly, for us personally, what might it mean for us just in our own lives to take our stand and serve the people who we do know, who are around us, our neighbors, our friends, our work colleagues, our course mates, our classmates, our families. And how much of us, in terms of how we think about some of these things, are we only ever looking into relationships thinking, how does this relationship benefit me? I think we, don't we look over at the political discourse in America and feel desperately smug. Actually, we probably don't feel smug. We just feel kind of horrified that Christians are drawn to political saviors who basically say, vote for me because I will give you cultural power. And we look on that and say, don't do it. Don't do it. Be willing to give up power. But we're very slow to think of ourselves what does that mean actually for me in my own life? Not to be drawn to a political savior, but just to be looking to every relationship to provide me with comfort and ease or my own financial situation to be easy. And we're very slow to think, what's the real risk to me to be vocal as a Christian, to start acting like a Christian, to be known for someone who is kind, 
generous and helpful and actually beyond that self-sacrificial. I was reminded this week just as someone was telling me they'd become a Christian because their, their boss was a Christian and just they noticed that their boss never took credit for their work. And that was different enough for this person I was saying to, 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 to say, I, I want that. I don't find that anywhere else. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's this. The whole currency of the kingdom of God is dying to self, taking up your cross, following him, being willing to lay your life down. And as you do that, you're following Jesus. And as you do that, the world is changed. Not by us, but him through us. Shall I pray? Lord Jesus, we're moved because we know uh, some of the turmoil that's going on within our own lives, our own homes, but also, Lord, our neighbours, our friends, our work colleagues. Lord, we fear for what the next few months and years will look like across our city and particularly within our own neighborhood, just where we live and will see difference and change. Lord, we acknowledge that it might be a temptation for us to want to run away, move away. And Lord, we suspect that there is a call on our lives that you've placed that means that we are not simply looking to emulate the values of the world, but we're called to something different. Lord God, that troubles us because we know, we detect, even where we believe, we know very often we don't want to follow. And so, Lord, we say, just as the prophet Isaiah said in that very chapter, it's quoted here, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, Pour your spirits into our hearts that we are able to not just say that, but mean it and that we're drawn to you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd help us not just to serve reluctantly or self-righteously or, or Lord, that we would grow weary in doing good, but with our eyes fixed on Christ, knowing that we are not only have a pattern of one who willingly gave up life in order to save us, but that being the whole pattern, the fluency, the currency of the kingdom of God, that we're willing to give up our lives to that, we pray. Lord, fortify our hearts that these things would translate to action. Lord, we pray, give us wisdom and leadership so that, Lord, as we seek to know what it means for us as a church family to minister into some of these things, that you would enable us, Lord, to, to take up the call that you've placed on us. And, Lord, maybe for those of us where we're in work situations where, we, where we're quick to call ourselves Christians, but no one else knows it, Lord, help us to be vocal. Help us not to be shy around our faith. Be willing, Lord. Help us to be willing to take up our cross and follow you, we pray, so that others, through our conversations with them, would come to know something of the incredible power of this upside-down kingdom that gives away power as the calling of our kingdom. Amen.